So the book of Philippians. I had this thing about the book of Philippians since I was in high school youth group. I was in an organization called Ambassadors for Christ, and we'd get together once a week or once a month at a weekend at some of one of the neighboring churches. And every weekend when we would study the Bible, it was always the first chapter of Philippians. I also was a part of a, a group of uh, students that met at our high school at a whole house across from the high school on Thursdays every week for prayer and Bible study. And you guessed it, the topic of our study was the book of Philippians. I think I probably still have the first chapter of Philippians memorized 50 years later. As an adult and a pastor, I still get this little jolt of amazement and wonder every time I read this short, four-chapter book of Philippians. And I, I'd encourage you to go home and read it. It is fabulous. Here's the thing I love about it. The book is so suffused with joy. Joy oozes out of every passage. And it comes to a striking climax in that short little four-verse section that we read today. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Doesn't that sound great? I want joy. I want to live a joyful life. And what's so amazing to me about this letter of Paul that is so full of joy is that Paul wrote it from the depths of a Roman prison. I cannot imagine, literally, I cannot imagine how horrible the conditions must have been in a Roman dungeon in the first century. You see, for Roman inmates, their prison cell was often the last stop before the grave. Not many people got out of a Roman prison alive. And so we can speculate that Paul thought that the end of his life was near. And still, there is joy. How can we explain that? So joy, of course, of course, must be deeper than our external circumstances. Joy must be different than happiness. Happiness is fleeting. The child is happy when she opens that present and finds out that she's been given something she asked for, but the happiness is gone when she quickly tires of playing with that toy and becomes more interested with the toy that her brother is playing in with that, of course, he won't share. Joy is deep. It goes beyond the realities of what's going on around us. It's different than the easy and fleeting thing we call happiness. Joy is complex. Joy is complicated. Joy has to come from the inside. And joy sometimes emerges even in the midst of disruption. Joy has lasting power. It stays with us. In the first lesson, the prophet Zephaniah urges God's people to rejoice in God. Such rejoicing would have been hard for them. The nation of Judea was a small bit player on the world stage as the superpower of Assyria was in decline, and the next world power, Babylon, was on the rise. And Judea was grasping for independence. They were in a rebuilding mode. The history tells us that for the nation of Judea, there was to be no break in the clouds in this political intrigue. They had no hope for a better life or an easier life. And so for the prophet Zephaniah, the imperative to rejoice had nothing to do with what was going on around them. And it had everything to do with the fact that God was present and God was at work. Because God is present, we have joy. Because God diverts enemies and evil, we have joy. Because God cancels judgment and forgives sins, we have joy. And joy now undergirds the life of those who belong to Christ. Paul agonizes in prison and yet finds joy. Paul writes to people who live in agonizing times, who live between a Roman aristocracy and a Greek majority, between the emperor's cult and the cult of the local gods. And he reminded them that in Christ they knew a source of life that is far deeper than anything, any thing around them could offer. 
Listen, dear church. The God of the universe is seated beside us, hovers over us, dwells within us. God transcends all the things that bring us happiness and pleasure, even the things that bring us hurt and fear. The Lord is near. That's the proclamation on Advent 3. We look forward to Jesus coming, knowing that his birth is the first chapter in a long story that will lead to his death and resurrection. And in that crucial event, we know for certain the love of God, the presence of God, the power of God. And that presence and that power enable us to look beyond our present circumstances and know real joy. We now know that God holds us more tightly even than death. That is cause for joy. I realize now that when I think of those things that bring me great joy, I realize that God is nearing them. When I'm with a friend and, and we're having one of those deep and long conversations where time suspends and you don't even know how long you've been talking, God is near. When I'm sitting with one of my sons and his wife and I realize in that moment just what wonderful people they are, God is near. And when I'm in the outdoors walking with my wife and my dogs, savoring the beauty around me and just frolicking in the playfulness of the dogs, I realize that God is near. But sometimes, dear church, we sabotage our own moments of joy. Let me ask you a question. So how many of you, when something great in your life is happening, and you start celebrating only to find yourself thinking, now don't get too happy, that's an inviting disaster. You know, the other shoe is about to drop syndrome. Something wonderful happens, and for a brief second, we let joy wash over us, and then five seconds later, the joy is gone, and we're panicked about the bad thing that we're inviting to happen now. Parents, how many of you have stood over your child while they're sleeping and thought, dear God, I love this kid more than I ever thought possible? And in that same second, fear washes over you, the fear that something horrible is going to happen. For the same reason, for some reason, we insist on holding dress rehearsals for tragedy in moments of deep joy. Sociologist Brene Brown writes that we do that because joy is one of the most vulnerable emotions we experience. When we feel joy, it is a moment of extreme vulnerability. Joy is beauty and fragility and deep gratitude and impermanence all wrapped up into one experience. And so when we can't tolerate that level of vulnerability, joy becomes foreboding and we move to the mode of self-protection. And part of the way we protect ourselves from is to prepare ourselves for pain. Because we know it's coming, right? So when we experience joy, we start planning already on being hurt. Which is really not very helpful, is it? You can't plan for painful moments, they just happen. And so no amount of planning can prepare us for the pain of what mostly happens unexpectedly and as a surprise. And so the collateral damage of knowing that pain is coming is that we squander our joy. And we need joy. We need joy to build up our emotional reserves. Joy makes us resilient and allows us to remember the fundamental goodness of our lives, that God is with us, even when painful things happen. So in order to sustain and practice deep joy in our lives, we also have to practice gratitude. One of my spiritual practices is to journal. And I begin my journaling each day by writing about something that I'm grateful for. Now, not everybody's a journaler. Well, how about beginning your dinnertime conversation with going around the table and letting each of your member of your family share something they are grateful for? 
Or when you say your bedtime prayers, begin by noting what you're grateful for that day. You see, there is a really powerful connection between joy and gratitude. Even in this short paragraph from Paul, 2,000 years ago, Paul got it. He said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Embodying and practicing gratitude changes everything. Gratifying gratitude is that unifying part of human existence. Gratitude puts off the foreboding and it allows us to revel in the joy of accomplishment or love. It allows us to savor the moments of joy and let them sink in, of really feeling it, of basking in it. Dear church, the Lord is near. The Lord is coming and the Lord is here. That's our Advent celebration. The Lord comes with salvation and forgiveness. The Lord comes to banish death forever. The Lord comes. Rejoice! And the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Give number 267, Joy to the World. 267.